Now, the principal reasons why you trust will become a sham are that trustees who are beneficiaries uh, fail to administer the trust in accordance with the provision of the trust deed and the trustee act. Okay? So in other words, trustees treat the assets as if they were their own. Now, I guess, let's start by saying, well, what are the consequences of a trust being a sham? Think about who's trying to get into your trust. Your spouse? Because you're trying to use the trust as a shield between relationship property and separate property in your trust, your own separate property that's they're not allowed to take half of, they might be trying to get in there. Another stakeholder trying to get into a trust might be uh, the IRD. They might be trying to say it's not a trust because there's significant tax advantages to them for doing that. They might say, for example, you're trying to use a trust to break tainting, but you haven't treated the property as trust property. It was never trust property. It was actually personal property. Suddenly, instead of being a, a dealer in land and property or a property trader in a trust, which shields everything from tainting, if it's set up right, reverts to being a sole tradership and taints everything around you. And if they can prove that your trading trust was in fact a alter ego trust, and they can retrospectively assess you as, an, as a sole trader, then all of those other properties you sold on capital account because they were not tainted, we're going to discuss tainting shortly, they suddenly become taxable through association. Can you see what a disaster that might be? Uh, and another stakeholder could be just a creditor. You've gone bankrupt, you've got assets inside the trust, you want to protect them, they say this trust is a sham, it's your alter ego, etc. So trustees who treat their assets as if they were own really do expose themselves to all of these terrible risks. So the answer to this, of course, is uh, how do you avoid trusts becoming shams? We say adhere to the two Ds. Discuss and document all transactions. Okay? Discuss, meaning when you have a glass of wine with your partner and say, hey, we're going to buy that house, that is not dinner. That is a board meeting of trustees. Okay? And when you've finished your board meeting of trustees, make sure you ring the independent trustee and have the same conversation with your independent trustee. Because you have a duty to act unanimously, which means you all have to agree. That's the discussion, and then you should document it. Because the evidence that you show the court is not, hey, yeah, we talked about this stuff all the time, we acted unanimously, because they won't take that. To, to an extent, they might take a bit of it. But what they want to see is the resolutions of the trustees who were dealing with separate property and writing it all down as to what their decisions were. What you don't want to do is just, is just sign the minutes of the trustee meeting that never happened. Okay, that's the leaky building of the, of the legal fraternity. Where you go to your accountants or go to your lawyers and you sign the conveyancing transaction as, as uh, trustee and in the same breath you sign the minutes of the, the minutes of the meeting of trustees but you never had a meeting with trustees. Your lawyer never spoke to you when you bought the property. You just sent him the sale and purchase agreement. That is potentially an emerging sham trust or an alter ego trust. Be very careful. In other words, behave like a trustee dealing with trustee assets, not a person dealing with personal assets. 